So Daniel, do we have everyone on? Yeah, we're good to go. Uh, hi everyone, so welcome to the first IRC York section um, on uh, lecture, um, on presentation. So this one is our uh, first one and it's joined with the IET. Actually, I probably better introduce myself as well, that always helps. Um, I'm Rhiannon Jones and the IRC president for the York section this year. So um, this is our first one online on Zoom, so hopefully it goes pretty smoothly. And as I said, it's, it's a joint paper with the IET. Um, but before we get going, we've got our next two papers coming up as well. So we've got the IRSC Presidential Lecture on Thursday the 19th of November. Um, and I will send registration details um, for that in the coming days. Um, and we also have the, our annual maintenance paper in December. Uh, I think it's on the 10th of December this year. Uh, that will be by myself and my colleagues, uh, Ian Puckerin and a couple of others. So we'll keep you posted on that one as well. So... Tonight's paper is all about the Transpennine uh, route upgrade project and it's going to be presented by Tony Kerry, who works for Network Rail as a signaling engineer. So uh, with that, I will hand you over to Tony. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've, we've put uh, this presentation together just to give you a flavour of what's sort of happening behind the scenes in the uh, Transpennine route upgrade. Um, Obviously, we all know it's a very, very large project. Um, it's, it's got um, a lot of route miles in it. So how are we developing a program of this scale? And how are we confirming safety and value for money and putting our passengers and freight users first um, on such a large scale scheme? And how is it going to be fit for the 21st century? Um, for those of you that don't really know um, we're going from Manchester Victoria all the way through to York and probably Selby um, but it's obviously across a lot of rugged terrain through the Pennines and it is the the spine of our northern rail network um, right so so some of the the major features we've got 29 level crossings we've got six miles of tunnels we've got 76 miles of track um but also it's sat within the footprint of northern powerhouse rail um which is a future development scheme so it will facilitate that work for the future so from liverpool into manchester and from york all the way up to newcastle and out to hull etc and within the scheme itself, there are a number of very major interventions like remodelling of Huddersfield Station for tracking through to Ravensthorpe. Um, but pulling it back to basics, um, the requirements that we actually have um, are electrification of that route is a, is a main part of, of what we want to be looking at and what we are doing. Um, that obviously... Um, needs to be tested for affordability, um, but also we will get better rolling stock performance out of it and it aligns with Network Rail's and the UK's decarbonisation strategy. Um, we also have the increased capacity um, that we want these four fast and two semi-fast trains additional in already a very constrained network and um, reduce the journey time as much as we can. I think one of the one of the really critical things is to make sure that we are hitting that target of 92.5% ppm um, for for the line of route. And and this is really what what this presentation is about is how we are getting to that um, <clears throat> performance measure. Um, so we've got four presenters for you this evening. Um, we've got Stephen Yule from Jacobs, who's going to look at the digital twin work that's ongoing. Um, the pram modelling work um, from Aaron Johnson and how it is influencing our requirements. Um, the path to digital train control. Um, Paul Roberts is going to take us through that. And also um, the weather resilience and climate change adaption from James Stevens. Um, and obviously that is with, with the things that are happening, the extreme weather events that we are getting, it's something that Network Rail is certainly focusing on to make sure that we have got a, sell, a safe and resilient railway. So I will hand over to Stephen now. Thank you, Tony. Much appreciated. And uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Thank you for taking the, the time to join the session. Uh, so my name is uh, Stephen Yule. Uh, I've been on the TRU programme now for about 
three and a half years, so time's flown by. Uh, I've done various different roles on the on the project. Uh, at the moment, I'm the asset management and information management lead for the for the program. So I have a sort of central function, uh, which covers the the full uh, the full program. Uh, within Jacobs, I'm an associate director within our strategic consulting business, uh, but the majority of my time is spent focused on on TRU. And we'll talk today. A little bit about digital twin. Uh, what I'm not going to do is get too much into the detail about what a digital twin is and isn't. I've been sort of involved in sort of discussions on the program for a uh, about a year on this, and and it's great. We could probably spend uh, most of this uh, this session debating what a digital twin is and isn't. So what I'll try and do is, is frame it in the context of of TRU and the journey we've been going on. You know, we didn't we didn't sort of set out and say, oh, we're gonna we're gonna we want a digital twin for TRU. It's been an evolution, and what I'll do is I'll talk through that and how we got to this point. So really a lot of what we've done and this is probably applicable to most whether it be rail projects or other other sort of infrastructure projects uh, and a lot of this is around joining the dots so you'll hear me mentioning this a few times so a few things we did and, and ultimately there's the imperative for network rail of putting passengers first but on our digital journey that i'll talk you through on the next slide in a second is how we join some of these dots together and a few of these things we did were the uh, joining the information management team and the asset management team together on the program so we had an asset management team we had an information management team that focused on things like BIM, GIS, common data environments and we actually joined those teams together because what we found was there was a common language between both teams so you know as an asset manager I tend to take a, a full life cycle view so uh, I'm very interested about how we use data and information at different stages of the life cycle uh, and information management often thinks in the same way and what we found by joining those teams together we've actually been able to generate a lot of synergies as a result we focused on making information accessible uh, that's not just to designers that's to everybody on the program but making the right information accessible in a secure and safe way uh, you know one of the questions we'd sometimes get from say the comms team how many bridges are there on the current Transpen Armory upgrade. Uh, surprisingly hard to find out sometimes, uh, you, you would think. And, and a lot of what we focused on is actually how can we make that information accessible. A single version of the truth, you can have multiple sources of a truth, but we were very focused on making a single version of the truth for the program that can draw upon multiple sources of the truth. Uh, a digital by default approach in, in the way we work and the way we operate. Uh, joining the dots, as I've, I've already mentioned, which will be a bit of a theme as we go through this. Uh, challenge, you know, accepting that change will happen. This is a long-term program. Uh, and when we set out at the beginning uh, and what the end looks like will be quite different. So say if we want to hand back uh, data at the end of the project, so related to assets, the systems that were there at the start of the program may be very different to the systems at the end uh, and an open and collaborative approach. So that's within the program, but also you know, supporting sessions like this. You know, we want to share the knowledge and the things we've learned. If we go on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly. There's a lot going on here, but this is sort of trying to show our digital landscape on the program and how things connect together. Uh, very briefly, in the top left, you've got a, a little dash box, and that they are external network rail systems. So some of you may be familiar with things like Ellipse, Inum Cars. You've also got other systems like FMS and Trust that Aaron Johnson will talk a little bit about uh, uh, later but they're all separate they've evolved organically and they're they're a little bit disconnected but that's that makes sense of you know evolved over a over a number of years so what we did was we've created a central data warehouse where we can pull all the relevant uh, asset uh, data relating to tiu into a central location and structure that data so we can start to do some interesting things with it that's great that gives us a snapshot of what's there today and we can start doing some analytics on it and again aaron can touch on some of the stuff we're doing there that tells us where we are today we also then had a, an asset uh, interface tool that allowed us to go into that and actually modify it during the grip stages so as we start to get a uh, a more clearer view of, of that design we can start doing different analytics on it but ultimately by the time we get to the end of the program we may actually have a good replica of what was actually built but from an asset data perspective aligned to a thing called the minimum asset data requirements within network rail uh, that dictates which attribute you need to capture in the middle we've got our common data environment project wise project map and track record and we've also introduced uh, something called i model hub uh, which allows you to pull um, native bin files from the common data environment federate them together in a cloud environment lots of buzzwords there but federate them all together so what that basically means is so anybody on the project with that project wise access can go into uh, i model through Chrome or, or Safari, whatever browser, and actually start interacting with the with the free, with the three D models uh, on there and start doing things like virtual design reviews, commenting. Uh, we're also looking at ways to actually introduce uh, hazard uh, recording within that three D environment as well. So we go on to the next slide, please. We won't go into this in too much. So that sort of digital replica I was talking about on the next page kind of evolved into a request to, well, okay, how do we make a digital twin for TRU? Uh, very briefly here, what we've 
done is created you've got in the center there a digital twin of a you've got the digital twin of a bridge and the physical twin of that bridge and what we've shown around the outside is that life cycle approach from design to intervene to operate to review and then you've got that flow of data uh, and from that data you can make um, you can get insights so you can do analytics like Aaron will talk about you can then make decisions so you can model those within that BIM environment you can then uh, do interventions and those interventions should ultimately link to the business outcomes a bridge could be a digital twin uh, bridges can be a digital twin uh, your whole railway could be a digital twin so that's why I won't get into the whole sort of debate about that and start talking about ecosystems of digital twins because yeah I, I won't do that today uh, but underpinning all of this we, we're focusing on five key themes on our digital twin journey so structure people process technology and data a lot of people focus on the technology and the data one takeaway from this if you take anything away is don't just focus on those, the people, and we're seeing this more and more, the people journey, that transformation, the business transformation to do this is gonna be the biggest challenge. By bringing systems like this in and approaches like this in, you will actually have to change the way you operate as a business and taking people on that journey is as we're finding the most uh, challenging part so far. If we go on to the next slide, please. And this is just uh, very, very high level, but what you can see here is what we call the digital replica. So that's what I sort of mentioned on the sort of first page, this uh, sort of replica uh, of the world, uh, moving through a transition uh, towards a digital twin. So uh, the reason why I say the first, uh, the big picture I showed before was a replica was because although we do take information from existing NR systems and we can uh, do analysis on that uh, and we do some interesting insights into that, uh, we've got that 3D environment and so on, it's not really connected to the live asset, the live, the live thing you want to look at. It's, it's historical information. It's, uh, it's looking at information within systems. I think it's really only when you start getting that uh, right time, or a lot of people talk about real time, but you, know, you don't really need real time information for a bridge. It gets a train over it, you know, 10 times a day, you want right time information. And there's many different ways you might want to collect that data. You know, might, you know, from 5G down to sort of Bluetooth to whatever different way you want to collect that information and it'll be different for different types of, uh, uh, of assets. But that's when you start getting that feedback loop, when you start getting the information from the live asset, then being able to do that analytics, being able to make decisions and being able to intervene, whether that be sort of physically or remotely, that's when you're really getting into that digital twin territory. So on this diagram, you'll see here, we've got increasing data sophistication and on the, uh, again, lesser right, we've got the increasing automation. And this is what we've created as a concept uh, for TRU. Uh, we can see there sort of how we go on that journey and it is a long-term journey to get there. This is not something that will happen quickly. Uh, but you know, we talk early on about the, within the, within the plan about creating that sort of foundation of data, uh, of structure process people, and then how that will move forward to the idea of creating a concept twin to actually prove that it works. And there's already some good examples out there of how you could do a concept twin. Uh, finally, on this slide, very quickly, our sort of definition of a digital twin for the program is a digital combination of multiple static and real-time data sources, analytics, and visualizations to provide enhanced understanding and insights across the rail across railway disciplines, systems, and networks, all aligned to the imperative of putting passengers first. And if we go on to the final slide, I'll just summarize sort of where we've where we've got up to at the moment so we have a digital uh, twin strategy developed for the program it was probably the first strategy within network rail uh, around digital twin there is a, a center has created one as well but this was probably the first one uh, what we've done is we've aligned that for the center for digital built britain who has the objective of creating the national digital twin uh, we've created a one-year plan so okay we've got this great strategy uh, and you talk to someone within network rail they will say okay that's there we're, some of the stuff we're doing is there, how do we close that gap? So we created a one year plan to actually go on that journey. We've then realized, okay, there's still a little bit of a gap between there and the one year plan. So we're now sort of on the program, uh, generating working groups and so on with our alliance delivery partners to uh, to actually work out how, well, how do we get from, uh, how do we actually really start to move along this journey? And we're starting to get some really positive momentum, not just from the alliances, but also from senior leadership in Network Rail. So there's a real good pull and push happening now. Uh, so we've, as mentioned before, creating a solid foundation of data and information. Uh, Aaron, who will, will talk, he may not touch on it too much, but we're also working with educational establishments like University of Cambridge and CSIC, uh, doing secondments and looking at how we can further refine the approach to digital twin. Uh, I also support Network Rail through Project 13 and I'm a member of the ICG 
DTTG, which is a digital transformation task group. Again, trying to learn from other uh, other client organisations like Highways England, Sellafield, Heathrow, uh, on on their sort of journeys, or digital journeys, and trying to bring that best best practice back into uh, the programme, but then also working with others to try and disseminate that into the wider network rail. So that's it for me. If you've got any questions, drop them into the chat, and I'm happy to take any at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name's Aaron Johnson. I'm going to talk to you today about how we're using something called PRAM modeling to uh, inform the Transpennine route upgrade. Uh, I joined TRU four years ago as a graduate, and I've, uh, it's been a perfect platform for me to uh, develop in my career. And my current role is the data analytic uh, modeling lead for TRU. So yeah, first of all, PRAM modeling, what is it? So PRAM stands for performance, reliability, availability, and maintainability, which is a bit of a mouthful. And um, what that primarily involves is looking at asset reliability, how we maintain um, our assets, and the impact that has to train lateness. So yeah, Tony, if, you, if we go through these um, graphics here, we first start off with asset data, we then do analysis on that data, no surprise there, but from that we get insight. And the type of insight we get, we, we inform the engineers and the designers on the program with um, pieces of information to help them. So for example, uh, we could help inform them by where they could look at, uh, move asset point, access points to reduce time to get on site. We could also um, suggest increasing scope of renewals. We could also suggest uh, redesign of the layout to share the burden. But overall, it, it demonstrated by the two, two arrows. It's an iterative process. So the designers go away, they design their railway. We um, feed in with our analytics, try and help inform them where, where they're at. We even, uh, we model their designs and we assess how they're doing, assess what it's gonna look like in the future. We feed that back, they take it on board, they redesign. Uh, it's a cyclic process until you reach the end. And then the end outcome would be an improved engineering design and a performance improvement. So at a high level, that's what we do. Um, in terms of the challenge on TRU, the, with the next slide. Yeah, so Tony's mentioned it before, one of the first slides, we've been given quite a high level requirement set by the Department for Transport. One of them being to hit 92.5% service punctuality which is represented by that red dotted line on the graphic on the left. Uh, and then those three lines underneath are the performance today uh, over the past three years, separated by period. And the key message there, you can see there is a quite a significant shortfall. Uh, my role within the PRAM, PRAM team is to shorten that gap by looking at how can infrastructure um, positively contribute so that when TR is delivered, we're over that red line and we're performing well and above 92.5%. Now, the reason why this is such a big challenge and it's quite complicated is that, as you all will know, if you've been late on a train, um, the reasons for that lateness can break into many different causes, uh, infrastructure being just one of them. Um, sorry, Tony, if you, if you just go back. Sorry, yeah, thank you. So on the right, you can see that pie graph. We've got 9.6%, that red segment of tra train services that are late. If we break that down further, you can see with that pink block, um, which represents the train operators, around 50% of our trains that are late on the TRU is as a result of the train operator. And then secondly, it's infrastructure. So to, in terms of the challenge we have, you can see that if we spent all the money in the world on the infrastructure alone, we still would fall short of that target. So that's led to um, the train operators come to the table to see what they can do to help improve the, the railway as a whole. But as you know, I'm, we're concentrated on the infrastructure. So that one, one and a half percent represented by the yellow block, uh, I've split that down at the local level, which we can see in the next slide. So that, those bar charts, they represent the normalized delay. So that is the average delay per asset in that region. And the reason why that's important is because some of you may be surprised why Leeds is performing quite well when you compare it to Huddersfield. And that's simply because Leeds has so many assets and on that average level, it's performing not too badly. However, Huddersfield um, is, is, is a slightly different story. 
And the colours, um, so the green on the bar charts represents delay associated with track, and then the shades of blue represents the, de the delay associated with signalling. And just at a high level, you can see that from Leeds to York, the primary cause of delay in that area from an infrastructure point of view is track, um, because there's more green. And then from Leeds to Manchester, the primary cause of delay is signalling. Straight away, you can see just from this simple graph, how we can use this information to target investment smartly so that we can um, improve the track east of Leeds and improve the signal in west of Leeds to get that uh, optimized performance improvement. In the top right, you can see some screenshots there. So um, we, we've done this causal factor analysis. How do we get the designers, the engineers involved, engaged? So we created these front end dashboards, a couple of screenshots there. To, to present that visually along the route. And that gave them the pinch point for them to, to target. And then the black dotted line, this is probably one of the most important points really, um, is from that DFT target we've been given, that 9.5%, we've translated that at a local level in terms of infrastructure as to the level of improvement we need to achieve on the program. And if all of those bar charts fall below that, black dotted line then we can say thumbs up we've done you know what was required um, and we're on on our way to meet what the government want and and, and put in passengers first so then this gives you a good idea as to how we use our analytics data um, which is fed from what Steve said with the data warehouse we've got all data in there and what we can start to do is to do modeling assessments so if we go on to the Next, yeah, um, slide. I mean, feel free Tony, to go through for each one of these to the end. But yeah, so we've got a worked example here, and what we can start to do is understand at an asset level where we've got this delay, um, what could be improved. So in the top left, we've got a screenshot there of something called Project Mapper, which is the Trans Pennine Route Upgrades version of Google Maps, if you like, and we've circled an asset there, which is a point operating equipment. Um, and if you go to the right with the bar chart, the first set of bar charts, the pink bar charts, we've got average delay in minutes per year, which is 63 minutes. So this is real data. So for that point operating equipment, um, we're seeing at the moment per year, 63 delay minutes. And the average for a similar asset type for the whole route is 48 minutes. So straight away, we can see that there's a, there's a potential issue here and it's something to investigate. What we've managed to achieve and taking that line of sight I've just demonstrated before um, and taking that a step further, we've managed to create um, a model that utilizes machine learning to feed in lots of different data sources um, and to understand the underlying leading contributors of why that asset's failing. So with the bar charts, you can see we've got tonnage, asset condition, rainfall and low temperature. The tonnage, that, that's based on um, the train running data. There's lots of it. Um, the asset conditions based on network rails performance system. So you have the something called the FMS fault management system, but you also have ELLIPS, which has the maintenance data. So we know how often the asset's being maintained. That gives an idea of the condition of the asset. And then the, the, the reason, the good thing about having a central data warehouse is we can start to feed in external data sources. And we've in, pulled through the Met Office data. So when an asset fails, we know exactly what temperature it was at that time. We know how much it's rained. We feed all this information to machine learning model and it gives us this output. It tells us, um, gives us an indication of what, what's happening. And in this case, for this point operating equipment, we can see today that the tonnage is the main contributor, the main reason, the main driving force as to why this, this asset's causing this delay. And then the second one is asset condition. So this is good now, it's really useful, but the reason why this tool really comes into its own and adds quite a lot of benefit to the program is because we can start to run scenarios from it. And to the right, you can see an example of one of the scenarios, which is um, what would the performance improvement look like if we renewed, if we refurbished this asset, but we had the 2026 timetable in place. So for those who don't know the 2026 timetable, that's gonna um, bring, even more trains to the railway, which is a challenge. And so we've got kind of a, a contradicting thing here where we're improving the asset uh, in terms of its condition, but we're gonna see more tonnage. 
Running that scenario into the machine learning model, we can do like a before and after analysis. So the yellow represents what we get, what would happen in this scenario. And you can see the tonnage has gone up, uh, which is no surprise there. But that by refurbishing that point operating equipment, you can see the level of improvement we've achieved and um, we've almost halved it. So that, then we got the so what, and that leads me to the, the far left. We got the delay minutes uh, per year. So before we had 63, with the model running this information, it's telling us that between, we should expect with a refurbishment, 2026 timetable in place, an improvement to 34 to 56 minutes, which is with 90% confidence. And that ties straight back directly to the requirements we went through in the last slide. Um, which goes back into the DFT target. And through that, that gives us a good platform, a good um, methodology, if you like, to track what we're doing on the program, but also to guide the de designers sometimes, and we've had it before, where they're not sure on what the right option is between uh, renewing an asset or leaving it as it is. Um, and that's where we can come in and use this tool to help them. Okay, and this is just one example, one small asset. And as you expect, we, we, we've we rolled this up and we've done this analysis on over 100,000 assets um, over the years. And that's resulted in some quite impressive results. So year on year, as a result of this modeling, as a result of us helping the designers with their um, engineering design, we're expected to obtain these outputs. And for me, the key one with put, putting passengers first is that middle one, which is 20,000 more passengers arriving on time, um, and which is exactly why the PRAM model um, on the program is there, to be honest. It, it's there with the passengers in mind uh, and make sure we're all not getting frustrated with um, train lateness. But also, just a, a good point, is with the failures prevented, and the maintenance time saved, that has a good safety element to it as well. So, so we're preventing the need for our maintainers to be on site and for that many hours um, and to respond to that many failures. Okay, and as you expect, this is quite an innovative approach, not been done before. And um, it's using quite a digital approach to design. Uh, it's, it's expected to get those um, results, which is, resulted in to be being recognized in the industry. In the top right, it's been published in a, a magazine arc, arc, article, which we can share if, if you're interested, which goes into a bit more detail as to exactly how we've done this. Um, it's a bit old now, it's two years old, but I did fortunately win uh, a global award with the Institute of Asset Management with the work I've been doing on the TIU um, program. And then the bottom left, we've won as a team quite quite a few awards with the with the stuff we're doing just to summarize then um, before i hand over to paul i think what we've been doing with the performance modeling is we've been using a innovative digital approach to drive design and that's resulted in quite a few benefits um, as the programs evolved over time and within, with, with the digital aspect in mind, I think that's a good point for me to hand over to, to Paul. Thank you. And, and as Steve says, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Aaron. So my name's Paul Roberts, and I'm a, a program engineering manager working within the digital train control team that sits in TRU. And um, this brief discussion is not intended to be an in-depth technical discussion on ETCS. Uh, its, its purpose really is to give you into an insight into ETCS and, and its justification on TRU and uh, what that looks like in terms of a business case. So when we look at that, uh, that graph which has come out of the long-term deployment plan, the, um, the signaling renewals for CP7 and CP8 have been termed a bow wave of signaling renewals. And that's quite frightening when you look at the volumes that were delivered in CP5 and what we have in CP7 and CP8. And it's the considered opinion that a conventional signaling solution cannot deliver those types of volumes um, in, in terms of delivery and in terms of, of being cost effective. And so we need to really look at delivering some form of dig, um, signaling, uh, digital signaling solution of which ETCS is certainly the flavor within the UK and, and the rest of Europe. Those assets that you see in CP6, CP7, CP8, they are life expired at that point. So 
if we end up with a, a, a volume of assets which are, are still in situ at that point, we potentially could see sort of you know performance degradation, and and that really impacts on our, our maintenance teams in terms of having assets which you know become a burden to them, and really takes resource away from from elsewhere. Okay, Tony. Okay, so two documents which are probably worthwhile having a look at is the uh, the rail sector deal and, and the long term deployment plan because these are both you know focused on sort of digital railway and, and, and digital signalling. Um, the the long term deployment plan really is it's an industry wide plan which looks at that long term deployment and and how that's best to be delivered and really looking at how we effectively transition from a conventional signalling bias over to a digital signalling bias and, and how that becomes business as usual because to do that we need to really start challenging the way we work uh, currently uh, and that's that's quite a that's going to be quite a step change for a lot of people uh, the rail sector deal really is you know, is all about people and innovation and it really sets out sort of the future partnership between the rail industry and government and at the heart of that deal is the is the exploitation of new technology and in particular um, ETCS to meet that future demand whilst lowering unit cost and uh, and, and currently in, in sort of in the spirit of that rail sector deal there is a uh, there's a project somebody's called target 190 and this is kind of a, an industry task force of NR DFT and suppliers and, and what they're doing is, is looking at reducing that SEU cost which is currently sitting at about 360k per SEU down to 190 hence the title. So in addition to, to sort of lowering unit price ET, ETCS is also intrinsically uh, linked to sustainability uh, and as an industry we have a you know sort of a long-term commitment to, to having a sustainable industry. So next slide please Tony. Okay, so what does that look like on a, a regional sort of point of view? Well, the West of Leeds project uh, is often termed a pathfinder project. Uh, and and the, the West of Leeds straddles the Pennines. It's uh, geographically quite, quite challenging. But from a pathfinder project, what you start to get is, for example, you start to get your, your trained fitment in that particular locality. And with, you start that process off, uh, which basically starts to gear people up in various industries to st start bringing those trains to a point where you either fit them or you bring new stock in. Likewise with train fitment you also have to go through the process of driver training so you end up with a volume of drivers that have competency based on ETCS. Not only do you then start having competency based drivers with ETCS you also have a defined training area initially that can be used for other schemes to bring drivers in at some point of time, whether that's during possessions in white periods, but you have that facility available. And also, ETCS on the, on the west of Leeds effectively becomes a, a central hub. So it spans uh, across that uh, LNW and C and, and, and LE, LE, LNE regions. So you can then start building other schemes off that central hub. So an ETCS in this area, certainly the, the, the flavour, certainly in the Northern Powerhouse Rail will be probably ETCS. So it makes perfect sense to not be interfacing in and out from a conventional scheme across this route into um, schemes that which are future schemes which are potentially going to be ETCS. Next. So why digital signalling on TRU? Well, it aligns with the overarching objectives of the UK. And it delivers on that digital promise of, of the rail sector deal. TRU is a potential catalyst for um, a scheme which is uh, Wigan Warrington and beyond, such as NPR, ECML, and, and also interfacing into HS2. ETCS is an ATP system. And if we're going through a renewal, I think that we probably have, or we should be fitting the safest system that we can, we can deploy. And for me, that is ETCS at the moment. But not only from a signaling perspective, also ETCS has the, the capacity to, to lower the, the sort of, we call it boots on ballast. So the amount of people who have to go sort of trackside working, maintaining cabinets and other associated signaling assets, a vast majority of that is removed with ETCS in a signals away end state. ETCS delivers on performance improvements and that's, we've, we've shown that through the business case and I'll, I'll go through some things later. And, and we genuinely believe this is a, a once in a generation opportunity in this area because 
the reality is that if we go down a, con a conventional signaling um, deployment in this area, certainly across TRU, that there will be no desire to revisit this, certainly from a, from a political standpoint, uh, because it's so disruptive. And so the time is now, and if it isn't, it probably won't get done for another 40 years until the, the, uh, the actual area comes up for renewal. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, please, Tony. So back in um, February of this year, the, uh, the OBC, which is the Outline Business Case, was presented to the Rail Investment Board. And uh, from that, the sort of the headline there is that, uh, that, that as a, a net present value, ETCS was, was showing a minus figure of, of about 23 million. And uh, at the time, we didn't feel as a team that that was that bad because effectively TRU is the first adopter. So as a result of that, it has the issues of, of train fitment. But what you have on the left there is uh, effectively the benefits that are gained, showing in green. And on the right hand side, you, you have the, the capital costs of deploying an ETCS system, whether that be you know, the actual having certain areas which might be an overlaid signaling scheme, you have your train fitment, etc. So as a result of this, ETCS was taken out of, of, of the OBC and the TDC team, which is the Digital Trend Control team, were asked to reappraise the strategic and economic case. And they were funded by the DFT, basically given a sort of a stay of execution, so to speak, for nine months to go away and look at that and really start to find the, the benefits of ETCS and, and assure those outputs. If you could do the next slide, please, Tony. Okay, so we, so we went away and we, we looked at all the different aspects of a business case and we, we tried to find areas where we could find assured outputs that we could actually say, hey, look, this is, this is you know, something which, well, this is where ETCS can really benefit your, your business. So if we move on to the next one, Tony. So as a headline figure, after, after the best part of seven months, we, we returned in August with a, a slightly different waterfall uh, diagram to the one you've just seen. But the, the headline there is we returned from sort of a minus 23 figure MPV to, to a figure of 91 million, which represents a, a business uh, cost ratio of, of two, which is, shows how, you know, high value for money. And, and how we got that, I mean, that is a huge turnaround. And, and it's primarily most of the benefits were obtained through a maturity in the modeling. And, and what we did is we, we, we picked up on uh, the benefits of ETCS, looking at real life driver and train behavior and running various different scenarios where we knew ETCS would, would be an absolute winner. And what you see is, is a, a whole raft of, uh, I mean, we, you could get a mod, the guys who did the modeling that they could do a presentation here on themselves for an hour. It's, it's that in depth. But what you see is a serious amount of, of benefits. And some of these benefits are actually, they, they had to scale them back a little bit because they were just, they, they were quite, quite huge really and they're a bit daunting but thankfully these figures that you see they have been assured this is not uh, not just a, a team of guys making this up these have now been assured independently so these will be going into the OBC as part of the business case also on the previous um, what came apparent was we had neglected to include uh, user and non-unit benefits in the previous waterfall uh, this was highlighted to us by uh, by the economics team in DRP so so they came in and they, they roughly around 51 million, which was quite significant. And also running parallel to this, that the, um, the East Coast Digital Project, they, they had a successful OPC submission. And as a result of that, we certain amount of our train fitment um, was wrapped up in their OBC, particularly with the OMTR fleet. And so that helped you know, to some degree with that first adoption approach of, of TRU losing that certain part of the train fitment. Okay, Tony, we can move to the next. Okay, so, so where are we on, on, on TRU? Effectively, ETCS, it delivers all the, all the DFT outputs that are required. It shows improvements in safety, in, in performance, capacity, journey time, line speed, and despite it being what we, we like to say, we term a, a pathfinder project, the economic case for ETCS is strong. And, and that, like I say, that BCR value is now at two, which is, is you know, incredible. And it shows that it's a high value for money. So ETCS um, has been put through various expert panels through what's been called Project Speed, which went through in August. 
and, and basically this was a deep dive into all the assured um, benefits that we we managed to pull together. It also went through the industry hothouse panel and, and came out of it quite favourably. So in terms of, of moving forward, ETCS on TRU, it, it provides a really good platform for future signaling systems. And in terms of if you want to increase the capacity, you've then got the benefit of introducing something like a, a system such as ATO later on or a different flavor of ATO. You've got potential to introduce CDAS, you've got your potential to introduce your TM for further train regulation. So it's a real, real benefit to have ETCS on, on TRU moving forward. The big challenge now will be how do we, how do we actually change that in terms of a business case, and not so much a business case, in terms of business change. And that's really the, the challenge we've got in the next six to nine months. Okay. So this is a, a last slide really. It's just, uh, we started off in February with a, a negative MPV. We were given a, additional funding to go away and reappraise that business case and develop it. And, and we, we basically worked up a set of work streams to highlight or certainly try and find some assured benefits of ETCS that we could come up with. We then looked at, we then moved into Project Speed as, as mentioned, that, that was favorable. We moved through the industry hothouse process in September and we're now submitting back into OBC2, which is we're actually submitting tomorrow. So obviously it's been, a, it's been a busy couple of weeks getting the documentation together and that will then go back in front of the Rail Investment Board in November. And, and just as a sideline, you know, some of those figures that we got in the model and were, you know, we're talking millions, but, you know, other little things which came out of this is, is that, you know, we saw, you know, 355,000 hours of signaling maintenance it saved, you know, red zone working reduced by 20% in west of Leeds, 48% on the east of Leeds, technical headway improvements, journey time reductions, AML improvements. We saw in terms of biodiversity offset setting 1100 meters just uh, of habitat saved uh, and in terms of, of uh, embodied carbon you know 358,000 kilograms of embodied carbon just in, in concrete alone on, in signal structures which whilst financially they don't add up to very much in terms of our hearts and minds you know they're big wins and, and certainly the the reduction in maintenance hours and, and people actually putting a, a foot on ballast is uh, I, I think is quite significant. So where we are is we're going back into we're back into the OBC2. We are going in front of the, the rail investment panel in November, and we've got a very positive uh, BCR of two. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is weather resilience and climate change adaptation on the Transpennine route upgrade. Um, so weather resilience and climate change adaptation. So it's a, a kind of a link to the whole sustainability agenda. It's a very prominent theme now in UK government agenda and cascading down through to industry wide agenda um, in network rail and beyond. So if we kind of start off at the UK level, Committee on Climate Change reports, which have been issued um, starting in 2017, <clears throat> summarise the principal risks to the UK from climate change, providing kind of a, a risk traffic light based system on the urgency of risks and the risks where, where they occur. Um, many of these are relevant to TRU. Flooding primarily, I think we all know, is a huge risk to infrastructure, something that disrupts lines, um, disrupts earthworks and other such structures and causes a lot of delays and, and safety critical risks across the route. Um, there's also risks regarding to temperature, wind, other such um, weather, weather incidents that can come along particularly on track and OLE structures regarding to, to heat and uh, metal materials that come along with that. So uh, at a UK level, we find that there's a quite a big agenda moving on this. And this has then informed Network Rail, um, their, their recent environment and sustainability strategy, which was released just, just last month, actually. Um, they had four key kind of sustainability areas they're looking at improving from now into between 2020 and 2050. Um, 
low emission railway, so looking at carbon, um, improved biodiversity, waste and sustainable use of materials. But on there is a reliable railway that is resilient to climate change. So I think network rail understand that the increased frequency and extremity of weather conditions caused by climate change, they have an ability for us to, to run the network safely and on time, minimizing delays, cancellations, potential critical incidents, keeping passengers and communities safe, hopefully. So there's a, there's a huge push on this from Network Rail. Um, and it's something that, as we say, TRU is quite a, a front runner as a major program for Network Rail. It's something we've, we've looked quite in depth into um, in the last, last couple of years, but even more so in recent months moving forward. Tony, if you can just do the next slide. Yep. So the importance of RACA on TRU. Um, it was mentioned before in the early slides, but as part of our main objectives and targets for the program, we've got a 92% performance PPM target. Um, very important, very big commitment we've made on the project to increase efficiencies uh, and reduce that kind of delays, schedule four, schedule eight delays. <clears throat> we've got a 2030 no plan destructive activity before this date. So. Uh, as, as building the and upgrading the railway, we've got targets around. We don't want to have any planned disruptive activity in, in the first few years of <clears throat> of operation. And, and part of that is making the railway resilient to potential weather incidents that, that can occur. So the more resilient we can make that, the less chance we've got of, of delays being caused as a result of that. And thirdly, and I think most importantly recently is the the safety critical aspect of the route and improving safety across this. Uh, we, we've seen in, well, over several years, but in, in recent times, there's been a couple of very serious kind of weather related incidents. Um, the, the most recent in August in Stonehaven in Scotland, where kind of um, increased rainfall and landslide from adjacent earthworks caused a train to derail and unfortunately, um, there was fatalities on that that particular accident. So I think weather resilience and making sure we're we're understanding that risk and putting the correct measures in place is is extremely important um, and something that's definitely coming to the forefront um, for the the business case that's going back into the Department of Transport at the end of the end of this year. Tony, if you could just move along, please. So what, what we've done on Transpennine route upgrade, and it's something we started, I've been on the program now around 18 months. Um, it started before before I was on the program, but is, is definitely kind of ramping up in terms of importance. Um, is developing what's called a racker plan, and a plan of action moving forward and a strategy for, for dealing with this risk um, across the program. Uh, and we've, I've, I've used this kind of flow diagram here in terms of understanding the steps for that. First of all, is understanding the context. So, where is this? Uh, where is this in kind of the political and industry-wide agenda? Uh, what are the different plans out there already? What are the strategies out there? I mentioned some of them before. So, network rail policy and strategy, existing resilience studies and climate change adaptation studies that have been done within the industry. Um, Infrastructure independences, so looking at not only the rail corridor itself, but adjacent highways, um, roads, things like that, and what policies they have. So highways, England, utilities, companies, and how their infrastructure is protected and resilient. And Network Rail themselves have existing racker plans on a kind of region-wide basis. So Eastern region, um, Northwest and Central, etc. So it's reviewing all of those and understanding where we sit in terms of understanding the context of of our program. Next, and I think which is potentially been one of the the biggest challenges we've we've wrestled with so far, and something we're looking at developing is is understanding the risk. So not only kind of the the obvious risks which we see are on kind of big safety critical issues, but also um, using data from Schedule 4, Schedule 8 data where there's been delays in the past, um, where we can speak to the RAMs and use local knowledge from, <coughs> from the route to find out key vulnerabilities, key kind of incident pinch areas where there, there might be problems. Um, 
where network rail data can help us support different assets and where, where they've had maintenance and resilience, resilience issues in the past and, and update those root requirement documents as, as and when needed. Um, what we also do is, is tap into kind of national wide data regarding climate change projections um, where we think that's going to be going, um, potential vulnerabilities that could be heightened as a result of those climate change um, changes over the next few years. And then also the, the main risks identified in the areas where we think there could be a, an intercombination of risks. So for example, we could have things like, as there's potential extreme temperature changes, so we could get ice building on OLE structures combined with increased wind, also increases the weight and the potential for, for damage there. Um, increased temperature and heat on tracks resulting in um, increased foot patrols and kind of looking at particular vulnerable areas, risking people through through hours on the track and, and working on there. We want to try and avoid that. So if we can increase resilience in design, that um, that will certainly help that. Which moves on to the next point, which is developing resilient design and systems. Um, what we want already and what we found is that often aspects of the design, different engineering disciplines, they they already have standards embedded within their their kind of technical standards and requirements regarding to resilience, performance, um, climate change allowances around, around drainage and certain things. So collating all of that together it is quite a task and bringing that into um, an open forum where people understand the resilience measures we already have on TRU. We've also got the role of TRU diversionary routes and how they are essentially an inbuilt um, resilience and support network themselves, but how that operates as a as a fail safe for the for the main route as and when or if if problems occur. We've also got, and I spoke about before, the interdependencies with other infrastructures and communicating that with stakeholders. So, highways, service distributions, providing wider resilience, focusing on kind of flood risk management, surface water runoff. Um, power and kind of the fail safe around power and transportation systems there and then also additional resilience monitoring activities beyond business as usual so we, we found within the industry we have monitoring activities around earthworks for example but can we extend this to scour at bridges OLE movement um, blockage at culverts looking at monitoring that and and preventing incidents before they happen um, which again is really important the last part of that, and it links to one thing we're trying to do, TRU as a program wide, is, is increasing communications and processes and making sure that we've got a clear process defined and understood by everybody that we can move forward with. And that's something we're currently in the process of developing. Um, <clears throat> but it's also at providing the right message to the right people at both senior management and, and kind of on the ground engineer level. Um, making sure they're aware of the risks, making sure they have a, a bank of good practice at hand so they can communicate that and cascade that throughout throughout their teams. Uh, particularly relevant on TRU as we're working with, as most of you probably know, two alliance delivery partners on the east and west of Leeds, making sure those teams and we collaborate with them, making sure that's, that's cascaded down. Um, and across the bottom, we've run there, and I think it's been a theme throughout, and something we've we've wrestled with on TRU is people development. So, making sure we've got the right capacity in terms of resources, human resources, people um, across the existing workforce, and the, the potential need for skills and 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 developed thinking around this area that may need to be brought in or amended as this process goes on. Uh, and at the bottom there, retaining flexibility in our approach. So two years ago, two, three years ago, when we started this this journey around Racker on TIU, our thinking has changed very much from then to now. Network Rail have brought out a whole load of um, additional guidance. The government steer is, is much more focused on this now. Um, where we was in 2018, even early 2019, is, is very different to now. If you can just put the next slide on, Tony. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, what does this mean for our delivery partners? Um, 
So as I mentioned, we've got two Alliance delivery partners on the west of east of Leeds. They'll be the ones delivering the, the work on the ground and how, what do we ask them to do and require them to do in order to achieve what we want to achieve with RACA. So quick screenshot there of the spreadsheet is the weather resilience and climate change risk assessment, which we ask everyone to do at GRIP4, so late concept design stage. Um, we ask them to list, uh, put together a list of the assets they're creating or modifying the key areas. The assessment of risk of it to each asset from each key weather and climate related incident, so rain, flooding, wind, whole load of different things. They're, they're due to consult with their RAMS teams accordingly on identifying recorded incidents in the past where we can learn from, from previous incidents. We also ask them then to put together mitigation measures including kind of how they look at that and proposed options for each aspect of the scheme. We get them to use the network rail now have a, a racker tool, so a, a risk mitigation tool which looks at life cycle basis of, of these risks. So looking at replacement rates, monitoring uh, and maintenance rates and how, how we can minimize additional cost across the life cycle of, uh, of the project. And what they have to do is they have to submit all of this along with a written plan at, e at the relevant grip stages as part of the, uh, the design process. So what we're trying to do is embed this in early design stage to make sure that we're one, reducing life cycle costs down the line. I think two, making sure we can influence design at the right points and actually get some real value from this, identifying key areas and, and mitigating that with smart design early on in the process. And I think three, it provides a, a wider assurance to, to Network Rail and our key stakeholders that we're, we're kind of focusing on safety and performance um, as part of our key objectives and our contract partners that are doing that at the same time, which is, which is really key for us. Um, can you just move on, Tony, to the last slide? So what I wanted to do is because we're still quite early on in the process on TIU, um, we didn't really <laughs> have any interesting case study examples of where RACA has been implemented, constructed and finished on site. So I kind of delved into some wider network rail best practice um, where we've been involved in the past. And that kind of, I thought this was, this was a great example in the Conway Valley line in Wales um, and the Welsh borders route severely affected by flooding in the last kind of almost a decade but more recently in 2019 and 2020 resulting in significant line closures damage um bits of land slip track track being washed away um and as part of that there was a significant play, uh, project of works of reinstallment in 2019 and 2020 um looking at additional resilience and protection measures against future events and even future proofing that for events with greater magnitude uh, in coming years. So in 2019, during repair works, um, Network Rail added six additional culverts installed in conjunction with the existing embankment, dissipating water rising against the embankment, uh, protecting the infrastructure and reducing flooding to adjacent neighbours. So around this area, we had quite significant issues with with flooding not only on the infrastructure but to uh, local infrastructure and the neighbours surrounding the rail corridor. Um, also as part of this work protection was installed to dissipate energy of flash flowing water minimising scour at the culvert inlets and outlets. So when, when we put these in it was identified that there'd be quite a high peak rate of runoff going through these areas so how could we manage that um, and put protection on that to make that future proofed. Um, we can see that on the, the top diagram there, if anyone can see that work being installed. And then in 2020, earlier this year, uh, rock embankments, which we can see on the, the photograph there, were constructed to dissipate the overtopping river water nearby, again, reducing the risk of scour to the track and protecting the track from washout. So what we found in the past that there was such a significant rate of runoff over these areas that physical um, protection was needed to prevent yeah, again, significant line closures and repair works being undertaken. So this is an example of, I think, quite reactive um, weather resilience, but something that had to be done on that level of the track. What we're trying to do on TRU is bring that into smart design and make sure that these resilience measures are included in, in our main design so we don't have to go back and spend a load of money and time um, repairing and reinstalling railways. So... 
I think that's it from me, Tony. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, just, just pop them in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, guys. I think uh, everyone will um, join me in saying that that was a really, really interesting presentation. Tony, I didn't know if you had any closing remarks before I say a few words and move on to question and answers. Not really, other than I enjoyed it as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. so um, as a, um, I'm actually a, a signaling engineer at Leeds and Maintenance and um, so for me, it was really, really great to see what's going on and the development, what's going to happen on, on my area um, or the area that I, I work at. I think I really hit home when we were discussing um, asset life um, expiry. Uh, the graph that shows in CP8 for CP8 um, is all around the Batley area. And for us, that's a really major area of concern. So when this comes through and this project starts to... Um, be realised and commissioned will be really great from a maintainer's point of view, so we're not clinging on to our assets. Um, it's very exciting to hear about digital twin. Um, it's, I don't think it's something that the industry talks about enough or utilises enough. So from my, from my perspective, I think in maintenance, we, we could really harness that sort of, um, concept, idea and technology coming through. So um, it, for, me, for me, being obviously a maintainer that's going to realise this project, it was, it was really great to hear. So I will open up the chat. Let's have a look what we've got. Um, let's have a look. The first question that came through. Bear with me while I try and figure out the chat function. So the first question uh, was about ETCS. Um, would ETCS allow the Pendolinos to run at full speed, 140 mile an hour? So I don't know if Paul. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, certainly on baseline 3.6, the um, the maximum speed you can run at is 600 kilometres an hour. So 140 shouldn't be an issue. But the certainly within the UK, you know, you'd have to start. You, you need consideration over the old knitting in the sky. You know, have you got an overhead system which can support that? So, but in terms of uh, technology, yes, by by all means, 140 miles an hour is not a problem. But the biggest, the reason why it tops out at 600 is basically down to Belize reading. You get to a point where the speed is too much for actually to, to power up a passive Belize and get the wave back in, in into the antenna. Right. So Belize is something that we're just starting to get to grips with. So hopefully we have got quality grips with them by the time this project comes through. Subset, um, subset 36, I think it's in. <laughs> oh, cool. um, oh, it's a well. In fact, quite a lot of these were ETS, so finger uh, buzzers at the ready for. Um, is the cost and the complexity build up after ETCS is deployed? Hmm. Uh, like the conventional signalling at the beginning was not as expensive, only okay. been expensive at the end of life. Is that the same for ETCS? Okay, I, I, I have seen this, and I, this is my oh. take on what I think has been said. Okay, so when you think about uh, current conventional signaling assets, during their life they're exposed to wind, rain, extremes of temperature, minus and positive. But with an ETCS, an ETCS system, what you've got to remember is you've, you've got an RVC sat in a, a climate controlled um, signaling center you know, or wherever it's, it's situated. You know, all the onboard equipment is sat within climate control within, within a train. It's only really subject to vibration. So comparing, you know, the the life cycle of trackside equipment with with either housed equipment in, in an equipment room or or within a train, is, is uh, you, know, you can't really compare them. So you, you wouldn't anticipate that you'd, you'd see that sort of same sort of level of degradation of system. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Does that make okay. sense? Well, another one for you. Would you. Do you want to join me to read them out or do yeah. you want to read them out and answer at the same time? Because <laughs> I think they're mainly aimed at ETCS. It's probably the most novel thing we've had on the railway for quite a long time. So the next one, um, how would ETCS assist in, say, Liverpool to Scarborough, where Lime Street has recently had a major overhaul with traditional signalling? Yeah, well, you'd have to make the decision. If, if you're certainly going to Liverpool, you'd have to make the decision, you know, is that viable to rip out a, a new signalling system? What, what you would say is that maybe you'd run on a conventional system and, and until you hit the, 
you know, the, the latest and greatest ETCS scheme going over the Pennines. So, you know, the, the idea is that you, you start with the, the TRU over the Pennines and then you start bridging off from that as, as, as renewals come up. But um, like I say, it would be a business decision whether you, you wanted to actually, you know, you could, you could potentially overlay ETCS within, within the Liverpool area, but, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of spitballing, if you know what I mean. It's, you'd have to look at it in its entirety. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the thing that, that Northern Powerhouse Rail is looking at at the moment as well, Paul. Yeah, because obviously we have just had Liverpool Lime Street done. So does it fit in with the long-term deployment plan? Probably not. But then again, if you're going to increase the speeds to such a rate that, that um, conventional doesn't cut it, then maybe you do have to go in and, and deliver an ETCS system. And certainly with Northern Powerhouse Rail, if we are putting in a new line, then that would be then ETCS. But yeah, it just depends on the business cases. <laughs> so the next question is all around Westcard and Westlock. So again, existing infrastructure. So um, I, I, I guess to summarise, so are the like, existing infrastructure such as Westcard, West, Westlock, going to be removed uh, as part of um as part of the upgrade or um is it ch like changing parts of different equipment yeah, well it depends whether they're they're you know etcs ready or not so uh you know something like a west can and west lock i believe are etcs ready but where you have you know interlockings which are not you will then have to you know recontrol with a system which will be able to you know have an input with an rbc or certainly have dialogue with an rbc yeah, I'm not sure an RRI system is very ETCS ready. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be quite an interesting concept. Um, so given the level of innovative, innovative uh, technology deployment as part of the programme, what is the programme doing to change? Oh, is the second part. Uh, what is the programme doing to change given the level of... Oh, here we go. Oh, sorry. It's in two parts and I'm very... No, it's okay. Confused. It's okay. Right, finished question from above, I found it. And um, given the level of innovative technology deployment as part of the programme, what is the programme doing to evolve workforce and people skills needed to manage the new systems technically and operationally? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really good question that, isn't it? And it's one that, you know, it's, it's a constant debate within the office when we were, when we were actually in the office, so to speak. The, um, <clears throat> there is a huge business change process with ETCS. Um, and, and you know, people are not judging or, or misjudging the scale of that. So it, it's definitely something which we need to look at. But I mean, one of the one of the things I, I was discussing the other day with someone was we were talking about sort of old school fault finding and how you know look when you look at the long term deployment plan and you talk about conventional signaling engineering and and wires and and, and lights on on structures. You know, you've got to remember that the sort of the, the nine and ten year old of today doesn't really have that concept of, of, of engineering. They're, 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 they're so technology savvy that, you know, the future fault finding is that for them. It, it, it's not tracing a wire out somewhere and, and it's all gonna be, you know, data construct. So, you know, certainly what we start to, to impose on the railway now, we need to, you know, think about, you know, the future resource in terms of personnel and who's gonna come into the industry. We also have to make that industry attractive because as we can see from you know current resources, certainly on TRU, you know it's it's a constant debate of of where we're going to get people from to to actually you know do you know sort of complete the works on TRU, and we've got to make the industry attractive. And one of the ways of doing that is you know to some degree we we have got to modernise a little bit to bring in you know people who are not necessarily you know come from pure mechanical backgrounds or pure electrical backgrounds. You know we need to start moving with the times a little bit. And bringing people in from the from you know IT based. Just as a quick thing to add to that, if that's uh, all right as well. And uh, sorry, I should have said I, I'm a civil engineer, so I'm probably in the wrong uh, wrong crowd here. Um, but in terms of around that question as well, I think we do have a challenge on the program in terms of there. Uh, I think TRU has come up with some pretty interesting and novel concepts for, for how we've approached the design, data-driven design, how we're using information, and so on. Things that would be beneficial to the region when the program's completed and things that we, we would potentially want to hand over, how we hand them over and ensure they don't end up sitting on, say, the digital shelf is a question I think we need to address because it would be a shame for either, you know, this, this innovation to make, potentially not support other programs 
but if there is a benefit to the region as well how can we ensure that that uh, that happens and that uh, that gets passed on and i would say it's still something that that needs to be addressed uh, particularly if the workforce and the skills are not there we can give you the best tools the best system give you this great uh, cloud environment for, for 3d uh, bim models and so on but if people don't have the systems and are not have not gone on that journey to use it it just won't get used and it won't get utilized so i think there's a risk and an opportunity there uh, and hopefully we can turn it into more of an opportunity yeah we're going to make it useful for, for our maintainers and operators absolutely you know, I don't, I don't think um, it's, I'd probably, sorry, I was weighing again from a maintainer's point of view. I don't think it's just the projects that see this problem with having to develop people's skills. We see it day to day because we try and bring in new technology, um, like remote condition monitoring equipment. It's, you, you don't realise any benefit unless you bring your people on a journey as well. So it's really good that sort of project notices early on so it can be like a long term um, a long-term journey like the worst thing is for us is when we get dumped with loads of new technology and we don't know how to use it so it is really great to know that it's being sort of it's an int integral part of your um of your plan so i'll have a quick look for any more questions um oh there's one about civils actually for you, stephen um, can you show a timeline for civils and ole work on the project will you basically be working from west Bees? Uh, I would say I'm still, I was going to say well I'm still a massive manager now but uh, I don't know Tony do we, do we have anything that shows sort of the the timeline I don't think we've included anything in the, the deck and uh, I don't think I've got anything to hand no not on because obviously it's <laughs> a bit sensitive as well probably I, I, I think it, it could be um, but like West One from Manchester Victoria through to Staley Bridge that's about to go into detailed design um, that's pretty much in the starting blocks to do that. Um, and then obviously build will will continue. Um, they've already started to do enabling works, I believe, for the um, the new miles platting curve to increase um, the speed around there. Um, and then for East One, um, we've we've started enabling works for that electrification piece from between Church Fenton and, and just outside of York. Whereas the rest of the program is probably still is just about to go through the option selection process to go into that that final stage of design development um, before it goes into detailed design so there's, there's, there's varying projects um, at varying stages um, but the first structural things will probably be for West One between Manchester Victoria and Staley Bridge if that helps Great, thank you very much for all your answers. I don't think we've got any more questions coming from the chat. So if anybody wants to use the hands up function, I think Daniel should be able to see who's put their hands up. So if anyone's got any other questions, then it's your time. I think dinner time beckons, but uh, yeah, th thanks all for um, for what you shared this evening. It's been very insightful. And um, remind us what the upcoming events are on the IRC, uh, Rhiannon. So our next, our next Zoom lecture will, is on the the 19th of November and that's all that's uh, being delivered by oh, that's a presidential lecture so that uh, it's titled cross acceptance of systemized equipment development under different standard frameworks and it's been delivered by Rod Muttram so I will be sending details out um, of that shortly and then the following one in December is on the 10th of December and that be the maintenance paper where um, we'll probably be talking about maintenance of the future and what's going on and where we're going next. So that's normally a really exciting one, um, but that's by, uh, by me, so I would say that. Um, but no, thank you very much, guys, for your presentation. It was uh, really, really interesting. Um, I enjoyed it and I hope everyone else did too. So if there's nothing else to add, then um, I'll say uh, have a nice evening and hopefully uh, see you all at the next lecture. Yeah, thank you for having us.